Hello and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is episode 219, Individual Literacy Assessment. This is another back-to-school focus episode. It is my strong belief that students have a right to receive individual instruction, feedback, and assessment based on individual work in every class they take in school. Every single class, including music, including ensemble music. That is a hill I am willing to die on. It is a right. The question then becomes for us as educators, how do we do that in an ensemble-focused class? What are some ways that we can achieve this? Probably one of the quickest ways for me to get some type of a snapback angry response on social media is for me to say that, that kids should be singing by themselves in our choir classes. They should be singing in small groups in our choir classes. That is actually a NAFME national standard is the first national standard, but here's what I usually get. I usually get some kind of thing where if I did that with my beginner singers to sing individually, they would quit, and singing should never be a punishment. Okay, So in this episode, I'm going to try to convince you, if that is your reaction, to every kid should have a right to, he- to be heard individually, that it is a responsibility of the educator to provide that individual feedback. How can we do that in a way that is beneficial to them, not optional as part of your class, but is also not a punishment? I think there are some ways we can pull that off. So this past weekend, I had the chance to visit with the amazing students of Magnolia High School, as well as the local chapter there of the Kodai Educators of Texas. In this episode, you will hear a portion of a presentation in which I outline our process of pre-testing our beginning students to determine an appropriate level for their individual music literacy work. There are, of course, theorists and researchers out there like Kodai, Edward and Gordon, John Kerwin, and many others who have for, for centuries now offered excellent observations and discoveries about ways to teach kids to learn to read music. But more recent science is now available. So how can we bridge the gap between, say, Kodai and the current science of reading? The presentation begins in the human brain with a discussion about how humans learn to read. What works for me is a something that teachers say a lot, but this is a fallacy. What we should be seeking is what works for kids' brains. What works for an adolescent human brain? That's the way we should be seeking our pedagogy. And within this framework, there is still room for teacher individuality and approach or different methods or law-based minor or dough-based minor or all the different ways that you could approach it. Takademi or ta ta or all the different things. There's lots of room for that type of uh, flexibility. But there are also things that are universally true about the way humans process music. So we talk about the parts of the brain used to process the various aspects of reading from decoding to recall to everything in between. You will also see some demonstrations and explanations on how I determine what sight reading factory level is appropriate for students. As always, the Patreon and Substack paid subscribers who opt in to support the show will have access to the full slides for this presentation as well as unedited portions that you don't get to hear here on the podcast on the main feed. I hope that I have stimulated some of your thoughts in this episode, and I hope that I give you some new ideas to try. And if you disagree with any of the things that I'm saying, I want you to head over to Coralosophers and let's talk about it. So that's Coralosophers on the Facebook page or at coralosophy.substack.com. Ludus, the platform trusted by thousands of organizers to power their event ticketing, marketing, and fundraising, has just upped its game with an incredible new feature, volunteer management. Now you can streamline your volunteer coordination like never before. Volunteers can easily sign up for opportunities and shifts online while you effortlessly approve signups, track hours, and manage your volunteer team. Say goodbye to volunteer management headaches and hello to seamless coordination with Ludus. Try it at ludus.com forward slash Coralosophy and revolutionize your events. Are you a director new to the profession? Or are you a seasoned director who is in a new place? One of my favorite tips for generating interest in the program and to instill buy-in is to plan a trip. There are so many options. You can go to Orlando, you can go to Ireland, or you can perform in a parade or a theme park. You can even take the stage at Carnegie Hall in New York. Wherever you end up, not only will your current crew look forward to the trip, but younger students will count the days until it's their turn to go. If you have no idea where to start, connect with Kaleidoscope Adventures at mykatrip.com. Underwriting and crucial support for this show comes from listeners themselves who choose to subscribe on Patreon or now on Substack. 
Subscribers get access to the private podcast feed as well as my Google folder full of goodies and much more. The producers on Patreon are Brian Long, Venture Studios, Jonah Clixbull, Angie Schilling, Danelle Eckert, David Kowalsik, Kyle Peterson, Max Jackson, Michael Herron, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kakajic. What I'm trying to make the case for is that all of the things that Kodai talked about and all of the things that Edwin Gordon talked about and all of those things are great, um, but the next step in the evolution, in my opinion, of our profession needs to be centered around whether or not our kids individually are understanding how to do these things. Um, And the reason I believe that is that every student in a public school context, I believe, in the United States because of the way we issue education means that if you live in a certain zip code, you go to this school, okay? Which means that our kids don't really have choices. Their parents do. Like their parents could choose to spend a bunch of money and take them to a private school or they could choose to pick up, pack up the family and move to a new town that has a quote unquote better school or better football team or, or whatever it is that they care about. But ultimately the kids that come into our classes don't have that choice. Um, they, they, are, they are at the school that, they go, that they've been assigned to, right? And when they take a music class, um, they are, whether they have informed consent or not, essentially, they are be, they're asking for a music education. Um, they're asking to be taught how to do music. And I, I just don't think that it's easy to make the case that if we don't assess kids individually, that we actually know how they're doing. And uh, in other words, if we don't assess their singing on their own, then how do we really know they're learning to sing? If we don't assess their music reading on their own, how do we really know that they're, that they're reading? And then more, I think more importantly, how do they know? Um, because one of the things I've discovered over the last 10-ish years of doing these individual assessments is that a lot of times kids discover, um, okay, let's put it this way. A lot of times kids discover that they're better at it than they thought they were. And sometimes kids discover the other way around that they're maybe not as maybe they're not as great of a singer as their elementary school teacher taught, told them they were, because in elementary school, if you're cute and sing loud, then you are the best one. It's personality, like it's the, the, and so then they get to my class, and sometimes they discover, oh, I actually need to work on this because, like I thought that I've always thought I was a really good singer, and now I realize that there's all these things that I no, don't know how to do. But ultimately, if we don't ever assess them individually, then, then we, they don't know. They don't actually know. And so I think of it more as a, an educational right that kids have uh, to be assessed individually. Um, and, and I would say, though, the vast majority of those times are kids who thought they couldn't do it, and then they can. And then they realize they can, and they, and they, they become, I don't even have to convince them that they can. You just heard yourself sight read that line by yourself. Did you know you could do that? No. Right, um, I had a, so I, I mentioned already, but I just this last week, uh, that was our pretest week at school. So I, I we have two teachers like they do here. Um, we have two choir teachers, uh, which means that I have the luxury of being able to step out of the classroom for any amount of time while while rehearsal continues. And so it, in in our program, um, it takes about a week uh, to get to all the freshmen one at a time because they mostly do it during class time. Sometimes I have them come in during that recess time I was talking about, like I'll assign them during that time. Uh, but I try to get to every single kid over the course of the week while my assistant runs the rehearsals so that the music, the group experience is still going. Um, and just this week, I had a girl who um, has been a real behavior issue so far in ninth grade at the beginning of the school year because she was utterly convinced that none of the things we were learning she was ever going to learn how to do. And because what ends up happening, and this is why I believe in this so strongly, is kids develop this impression that they can't do it. And the reason that they they get that impression, choir classes specifically, is that there will always be that one kid near her who's faster. So in the group context, the right answers are coming from her, not from this other girl and they start to intuit that because I'm not getting those answers as fast as this other girl, that I'm the dumb one, and therefore I, I just am not very good at this. And by giving her the opportunity to work at her own pace, she's actually starting to actually learn that, no, I can do this, and I, I can read the music, and all of that negative self-talk that I've been giving to myself has really been inaccurate. 
And that's essentially what I'm trying to prove to them through this exercise is that, yes, you can do it. Um, and just like any other class, though, you need to work on the worksheet, so to speak, at your own pace. Okay? So, for example, <clears throat> I'm trying to, I like to try to make corollaries to our colleagues in our school buildings as much as possible. So if, I, if, my, if my kid, my daughter, who's a 10th grader in my choir program right now, um, I just had a conversation with her about this this morning at, uh, from my hotel, because if, if in history class she gets an F on a paper, which means she didn't get any of the answers right, uh, didn't write, you know, respond to the prompts correctly, whatever, she gets an F. And the way that the teacher expresses that failure is to hand her a piece of paper that says F on it with all the red marks or whatever. She's the only one who sees that, right? And she doesn't, uh, and, and she knows right away that why the answers were wrong. And if she's going to fix it, she's going to have to fix it herself. That, that history teacher is giving her what she needs in that moment, which is that she needs to know that none of the answers were right, okay? But if history was delivered in the way choir class is delivered, then all of those answers would have been blurted out together at the same time. The correct answer would have come from somewhere, and then the kid who did not know would also blurt out the correct answer, and then they would not realize that they didn't actually know, and then they would all be given A's, <laughs> right? And then that kid's never going to learn history. And, and, and I said, well, so the difference, though, is in, that you guys got an F on your history paper in class the other day, but in history, you get to see that F by yourself. In choir, Everybody sees it. Everybody sees it. Everybody sees that Mr. Munz just chewed out the soprano section because they didn't know what their starting pitch was. And not because they're dumb, but because they just didn't do the work. Like, they didn't do the work. They know how to do it. Once I told them to do it, like, they know, okay, so we're in the key of B flat, and we start on an F, so no, T low, so. Like, couldn't you have done that 60 seconds ago? Yeah. Right? And so, but they got that F publicly. And that, because we're a group activity. And that part, of it, that part of choir is important because we do have to learn, choir kids have to learn that they're accountable to each other and that when, when you guys hold us back for 60 seconds or whatever, now the whole class has got to wait for another 60 seconds and that does matter. However, a lot of times if we don't also allow them to do this and fail in private, then they don't really grow. They don't really learn to grow. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about in this second portion today. All right, so this graphic is from a document that, um, that I really like, just a really good summary of the science of reading. And I'm showing this because these are the, the main regions of the brain that turn on when a person is reading. We have the phonological assembly, which is the part of the brain that connects the letter we see to the sound that it makes. Then we have this region at the, on the right side here, orthographic processor, stores the information for automatic word recognition. So that's like the, the part of our brain that, uh, that when we've done sight words a bunch of times, like we, we have that word memorized. And we know we don't have to think anymore about the sounds the letters make. We see the combination of letters and we hear the word the. We hear the word to, whatever it is. We're no longer thinking because it's stored in that part of the brain. And we're no longer thinking about the uh, anymore. Does that make sense? Okay, and then over here, uh, the phonological processor, <laughs> you can, that's kind of low on there, but it says processes sounds. So the, 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 the sound that we hear. So the part, when we're reading, we are engaging the part of our brain that hears even if we don't hear things. So the, the sound part of our brain turns on uh, in, in the same way that like we can, most people can like turn on an inner monologue or whatever, like we can say words to ourselves in our head. Right? All of these parts of the brain are operating at the same time when we read. Uh, now to the next slide, which is part back to my, oh, that didn't come out very well in the transfer. Um, okay, well, I can, I think if we look, uh, okay, so that looked really, really cool and pretty in my, in my Mac presentation. Um, so see, I'll see if I can uh, turn, make that make sense. So I pulled up a scientific study from these scientists right here. Um, Schoen, Anton, Roth, and Bresson, or Besson. I'm assuming they're French, so I probably said all that wrong. Um, but they did a study, an MRI study, that showed how a person's brain lights up for reading music notation, reading written verbal notation, and then Arabic numerals, so like numbers. Okay? And they, what they discovered 
was that the same parts of the brain, some portions of the brain, light up for all three. Okay? So some of the same parts of the brain, no matter what things you're reading, whether it's music, whether it's written like your native language, or whether it's a series of numbers, you get some kind of, by seeing the symbols, you get some kind of fireworks display that's very similar. But in that crappy image, you can kind of see under the music side that it's more. And I don't know for sure that this is true. I just know that I've spent a lot of time searching for a study that does this kind of thing, but for singers. Because all the studies that I, that I can find so far that light up a brain and do MRI studying for reading music notation are for a person sitting and playing at the piano. Now, the reason that's a gap is because I believe, my hypothesis is that we would see all of the areas that light up for the music reading, but we would also see all of the areas that light up for reading spoken language. Because only a singer has to, has to, has to hear the pitch in their head before they sing it, or else it's not going to be accurate. A piano player does not have to. Now, when I tell this to piano players, they get really mad because their experience is that they've played their, the piano their whole life, and I can absolutely hear pitches in my head. And I will then say, well, yeah, now you can. But when you were four, you probably didn't. When you were four, you were sitting at the piano pressing a button down, and the pitch came out. And you've done that so many times that over, to over time, you've associated that motion with that pitch, and so now you have a really good sense of internal pitch. But our kids that come to American public schools don't. Like they, that's not, that is not their, their experience. And so what I'm noticing from this image, and I apologize again that it's not super clear, in, in my version you can see uh, the outline of the brain and you can compare it. Actually, uh, Thea, would you go back to the previous one? Okay, so um, in all three of those, you see essentially these three parts of the brain are active, whether they're reading music on the piano or whether they're reading spoken language. But then with the music one, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a dramatically brighter picture. But what we lose, uh, the music one, we actually lost this one. Orthographic processor. When, they're, when someone is playing an instrument, they, they don't have that much brain activity in that area. Because they don't need to. Like if, if I'm playing the piano, I don't need to uh, very clearly and accurately hear C to E before I play it. And we're, when I say before, I'm talking about fractions of milliseconds before. I'm not talking about like two days before or whatever. But like ultimately a kid, when they're singing, they have to hear C to E before they sing it. Or else it will not come out correctly. It won't come out. They'll slide around until they find their neighbor's version of a C to E or whatever. But they'll slide around. And so a singer, very much like a speaker, has to hear that sound before they make it. Okay? So that's why I've got this harebrained theory that learning to read for singers is closer to learning to read English than we probably have realized before. And I'm super excited because I'm actually going to be interviewing um, a scientist who does this kind of research very soon. And I'm going to be uh, really going into it with her to see if this is something we can try to solve together. But also when I'm studying the, uh, the literature that is available to us, almost, and I, like I said, I can't find anyone who's actually studied that question which is, in my mind, a gigantic gap in our profession. The instrumentalists have studied that. And, and the, the other thing they didn't mention in that video, because I, I only know because I've gone in and read some of these studies that they were basing the video on, which is that when they, when they studied these musicians' brains, they weren't just playing the instrument. They were reading music while playing the instrument. Okay? Well, that's a huge difference, because they've also studied the brains of, like, say, a jazz musician who's improvising. There, that, that's a fireworks display in the brain too, but it's a different one. It's a very different one. And so what, uh, but they didn't mention that, and I think they didn't mention that for, because of a bias that exists where it, instrumentalists, we assume they're reading the music. We assume that a cellist is reading the music at some point in the process. Yeah, they perform from memory a lot, but they, they read the music, and they all do. Like pretty much every cellist, every professional cellist reads music. But singers... Uh, I, and this is, I think, just what I think is happening is that nobody's done this study because of how rare it is for kids to learn to read music with their voice without any type of auditory support at all. Like, as in, I'm just going to sound it out, I'm going to read it the way I read English. That doesn't happen very often in music education. So who are we going to study? They'd have to go to my, they'd have to come to my classroom, I guess, 
to study like study these kids and what they're what they're doing because what ends up happening is that when they're when you're reading music and playing an instrument at the same time almost the entire brain lights up um, and when when we're doing all of these reading based activities the there is overlap in which parts of the brain get used uh, and so I think it's a really uh, that that's like kind of the, the next frontier is for us to figure out what exactly is going on in kids brains when they do these things and again Kodai couldn't ask, ask these questions, uh, let alone answer them, um, as we think about how all these theories come together. Okay, so I made this. Don't forget, it pays to listen to this show if you are a music educator. The list of discounts and benefits for listeners just keeps growing, so your checklist for back to school means getting your sheet music at graphitepublishing.com or endeavormusicpublishing.com, sight reading materials from sightreadingfactory.com along with your student memberships every time you renew, choir folders and other classroom materials from mymusicfolders.com, and now, most recently, your Sub plans, your ready-made activities and assessments related to music theory can be generated for you with your 3minutetheory.com membership. All of these great vendors accept the Coreilosophy discount code. When you check out, you're going to get money saved for your program that helps you take your school year farther. So make sure you hit all of those websites and it supports this show. Um, this is Scarborough's Reading Rope, which is a very famous... Uh, graphic that is used oftentimes in elementary school um, reading intervention type things. So like this is just how to teach kids to read in general. But what I did was adapted it for music literacy. Um, you can actually, shameless plug, you can buy this poster for your classroom. Um, it's on my website. And I have, uh, I've actually started using this just this year because it's a new thing I just made uh, not too long ago. And I've started using this in my kids' pretests. Okay, so when I come in, and have each of the kids uh, do their first reading for me, I assess them and give them feedback based on how things are going on their reading rope. So let me give you some examples. Uh, first, well, first I'm going to go through the whole, the whole uh, document and kind of acclimate you to it. So all of the strands of the rope, uh, is everybody familiar with Scarborough's reading rope in general? Or is this a new, okay, so Scarborough's the guy that made the original reading rope. I am not Scarborough. That's why I left that on there. But then I took his design and put music concepts onto it instead of linguistic concepts. Okay? So the idea behind this, this image is that it helps us see that in order to read, in order to pick up a piece of paper that has stuff written on it that we've never seen before and read fluently from that paper, all of these things on the left are the things that have to happen in order for that to go well for you. And what happens at first with young readers, very young readers, is that all of these skills are very un loosely woven, and they have to think real hard about how to do all of them. And it, you know, in our music context, that would be like do, 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 re, re, do, re. <laughs> you know, those type of thinking it out kind of stuff. They're going real. They're, they're going real slow. But in English context, it would be our sounding out words. Or go, it goes real slow. The, and then they, uh, and there's always that face. Um, and that, that, all those things are happening because they have to do one skill at a time. Then, as they practice reading more and more, more and more and more, the, the strands start to weave really tightly to the point where they are eventually, the goal is that they are a skilled reader who does all of those things at the same time, okay, without having to think. They, they're doing all those things at the same time. So, in my version, the music version, here's what I've got. I've got the audio library. I've mentioned it already a few times today. That is our sound before sight. That is all the sounds of music that we might ever need. They're stored in our brain, in our memories. Okay? Um, and some kids have a very advanced audio library if they play instruments, typically. If they grew up playing the piano, if they're in band, if they're in orchestra, their audio library is probably really well developed and they can probably recall it pretty well. Musical vocabulary, and that's your things like, uh, that is the basic music vocabulary, just like is it called, is it an F or is it a G? Is that a B flat? Um, is that a half note or a whole note? Like they, they need to know those things before they can read them. Form and pattern, this would be things like, um, we just sang, we just sight read verse one. Uh, oh, I see that coming against verse two. That's verse two. I can just sing that part already because we sang it already. We already worked out the sight reading, and I recognize that. Or this is a chorus. 
And we learned the chorus yesterday. I can sing the chorus again now because I've already recognized it. So readers of all languages do that. They, they're not just music. They're, they're, when, when we're reading any language, we recognize, oh, that's that part that we read yesterday. Uh, I can see that pattern. Muscle coordination, well, I talked about that already quite a bit at the beginning, but that's that idea of just like how much energy in, the, in my voice, how much air, what vowel do I need for that note to come out well. Uh, if I'm in my passaggio, what do I have to do to get the note to be in tune? Uh, all those types of things are muscle coordination, and that's the part, that's the, probably the, the single biggest difference between reading English and reading singing, is that it's way more muscle coordination required. Because now, and that's why also in that video of the um, talking about studying instrumentalists as doing fine motor skills, I would make the argument singers are doing fine motor skills too. Like there are a lot of them. They're maybe not with my fingers, but with all kinds of other muscles. We are using fine motor skills to, to tune, uh, to adjust, to send air through our instruments, all those types of things. And if you are sight reading, it's very difficult to do that right away, right? That's why so many of our kids sing in a scared voice when they're sight reading and then suddenly sing really loud sounds during warm-ups or whatever, right? And then, of course, you've got to know some basic things about music theory. Now, down underneath here, uh, these are strategic uh, skills, by the way, uh, strategies for doing better. Down here are the things that we hope and we train kids to do automatically. Phonological awareness, that is, aware of the sound I just heard, okay? Decoding. That's, uh, you know, in English, that's where we're tracing our finger across when we're five years old and trying to read the line really slowly and sound out words, etc. For music students, that's our sounding out intervals, uh, trying to figure out what the solfege is called, but maybe we can't do it right away, we, but we can figure it out, you know, that kind of thing. And then sight recognition becomes the idea of like, okay, so I've, I've done enough do mi so's at this point, like sight words, right? I can look at that, I know that we're in the key of F, so I know that's a do mi so. That's, that's where we're trying to get kids to do. And eventually, they're doing all of those things at the same time, and they're moving that way on the chart. Okay? So, all right. So this is what I just did this week. And I'm, for this, I would like to see if anyone's going to be brave enough to be a volunteer. Would anyone like to pretend to be a freshman today? I can be a freshman. Well, you want to be a freshman? I know. Oh, you're like a, am I even, a freshman boy? I don't care. Either yeah. one. <laughs> Whatever you've just been always wanting to do. Okay. So, um, so why don't you? So, you, why don't you stand up and come out to about middle of the middle of the screen there? And so, you, it is now time for your meeting with me. You're very nervous. Okay, you're very very nervous because you're pretty sure that I'm what, I, what what I'm really here for is to judge you based on whether or not you're already good because that's what most kids think I'm doing. They think I'm I'm talent scouting um, to find the next American Idol or or whatever. Um, and so here's my little script. This, these are the things that I say to kids during these. And they, I prepare them in class ahead of time, like we know what, what's going to happen. But I always talk to them uh, in person, one-on-one. -on -one. I say things like, I, we, like when I say in class that I don't care how good you are at this right now. Uh -huh. I really mean it. I, like what, this is not, th think about this like you're going in for, to the doctor for a checkup. And you're nervous about a rash. Because it's gross. But they've seen it before. Like, they've seen it before. I've seen kids longer than you've been alive. Every little music problem you have, I've seen it. Okay? So we're just going to see how you're doing, and we're going to see where, what, uh, what needs to be your goal for this semester. And then I ask them this question. Talk to me about how confident you feel like you've been in class every day when we sight read things. Do you feel like you're getting it right all the time? Do you feel like you're confused a lot? Where are you, where are you with that? Uh, I, I think I'm fine. Rhythms... Like sometimes confused. So the rhythms, uh, keeping it going at the steady pace, yeah. confuses you. Yeah, and then and then when there's skips. Ah, uh, yeah, and the skips uh, that can take some time for some kids. But it doesn't How, look like there are any skips there. Yeah, so far we're we're not going to see any of those. So you should be good on that. Um, how about in class? Like, do you if you make a mistake when you're singing with the other guys, do you feel like you know right away that it was a mistake, or do you usually wait for them, or to find out later? I don't know if I'm right or they're wrong. Mm -hmm. That's normal. That's pretty normal. Okay, that helps me. So based on their answers to those questions, I am thinking about what sight reading factory level I might try them at first. So if a kid, and this is ninth grade, if I was teaching seventh grade, I would probably err towards lower levels or, or whatever. But for, for my ninth graders, if they tell me, if any of those answers are, I know, I know, I know right away if I've made a mistake then I go level two or, or level three. 
Okay? But if they say, it, like what you did, if you say, I'm not sure if it's right or wrong, I always just go to level one. Because then we're going we're gonna to build it from nothing. So then I would play the starting pitch. And I would ask him to sing Do. Uh -huh. And then I would ask him to sing our little scale pattern for, you can just like sing a little scale, I don't really care what. Uh huh. And then that, yes, especially <laughs> now for if, if we're being a freshman girl now, that's a very common uh, thing. And I would talk to her. I that's right. Yeah, I would. T I would. I would talk to her about. Like, okay, so just remember that as the notes go higher, if you allow that breathy sound to continue to happen, you're actually going to have some pitch accuracy problems. But in this exercise, what is the highest note? Can you figure that out? So. Yeah, it, it is. That's correct. So now could you just sing Do up to So and back down to Do? Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, Fa, Mi, Re, Do. And then I'll, then I'll point out to them, okay, that's great. So for this exercise, that's your answer key. That's all you need. Okay. And then I'll go ahead and have them scan it for 20 seconds. Uh, the other thing I do uh, to make sure during this individual time is that I make sure that they understand what they're trying to do when they scan the exercise ahead of time. Because sometimes kids think, well, what I'm really supposed to do is like have perfected it in my head already. Because I don't want to sing until I've perfected it anyway. And so they say, well, no, that's not really what you're doing. What you're doing is what, is what English readers do when they open up a book. I'm just going to borrow this again. Okay, I open up a book. I don't realize I'm doing this, but I open up and I look at things like, I'm on page two. There's a chapter heading here. The font looks kind of small. Now I will read. <laughs> so when, what we're doing here is we, we look up here and I go, okay, so I start on do, my highest note's so, got a lot of quarter notes, got some dotted half notes. I don't remember what dotted half notes means. What's a dotted half note? And then I might help them with that information. That's what they're doing in 20 seconds. They're just, they're scanning it for what the general lay of the land. And then it's time to sing. Okay, so go ahead and try to sing this, but here's what I want you to do for this demonstration of being a freshman girl. Mm -hmm. um, I want you, this one, let's do where you are able to do all that, but you make a bunch of mistakes and you fix it. Okay. In other words, you're able to get through it, but you, you stumble a lot. Okay. Okay, try it. You always stum yep. stumble a lot? Mm -hmm. you, yeah. So I gotta check. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do you count off for them? Um, yeah, I do. That's a good question. I'll okay. go one, ready, and sing. Can you sing the do from the beginning of the song? That is correct. Now could you go back to the last line and find actual me? Start there. Applause for the demonstration. That was a really, that was actually a remarkably <laughs> accurate. Can I tell? I'm, I'm oh yes, <laughs> remarkably accurate. Typical freshman girl who does this in October of this first school year for the first time. Taught a long time. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, and and so uh, and then the next thing I would do is I would point out. I would say, how many beats do half notes get? So you look at the second line. Do you remember that you kind of rushed through that extra, that part? And then she'd be like, okay, yeah, so just, but she knew. She knew that it was two beats. She just didn't do it exactly right. Now, in our, for, in many places in, in the country that do assess kids individually for sight reading, that would have been a failing grade. It's an F because she didn't sing all the right notes at the right time. And that, in a lot of our minds, that is what sight reading is. It's, it's, the, it's right the first time. That's sight reading. I hate the term sight reading because I don't think it's accurate. It's not accurate representation of what actually happens when we're reading music. I just prefer to call it reading. We are reading. So if I'm reading, um, if I'm reading English, I'm going to come over to this thing over here. 
You can tell that this is my, my, uh, the hill I'm trying to die on is that reading music is reading any other languages in our brains. It's the same. But if I come over here and I go, um, all right, top 10 tips for UIL sight reading, find the key signature and place do, mi, so on the staff, look at the time signature and see what beat, see, and, and see what beat you enter. I stumbled on some words. Nobody in an English context would hear me do that and say, he can like barely read. But in a music context, that's what we do. We do that to kids all the time. Well, because she made mistakes, she's a bad reader. And what that fails to understand is the way humans read. She is not a bad reader, she's a beginning reader. And beginning readers are very much like beginning English readers. They stop, they think, they process, they become phon phonologically aware more and more, a little bit each time, the same way any other reader does. And so what I do in, in, in my system I'll get to the way we grade this kind of stuff in just a minute, but I, I praise the heck out of that kid. Yes, you did all of the things on that paper. Way to go. You worked it all out. Everything that's on that sheet is inside of your musical vocabulary. You can do all of those things. So then in December, so that's a, that's a level one, right? We did level one. Okay, so but what I would tell that student as she's leaving, and typically this takes five or six total minutes for each kid is as she's leaving, I would say, so here's the goal. In December, you're able to do that type of exercise again at level one, but without as much thinking. You're able to, then we call it, you'll, you're able to read it fluently, which just means you might make a mistake here and there, but for the most part, your brain's not stalling out anymore because you've practiced enough. We get each kid the individual uh, membership so that they can do their own sight reading factory at home. They're only two bucks a, per, a kid, pretty much. And they all can do a, a level one as many times as they want so that in December when they come and do it for a grade, they're able to look at that and not be scared of it anymore and just move through relatively efficiently. And if they make a mistake, they're able to just fix it without freaking out. Okay? And once I see them do that, it's time for level two. Next up, you're going to hear two examples of some of my experienced choir kids pretending to be freshmen. And I gave them a pretty detailed little script of how to... Uh, do one of their sight reading pretests the way a freshman typically would. Now I have protected their name and their face on the YouTube video version of this for their privacy as they are minors, so sorry to these two who are not going to be become, becoming famous as a result of this. But this is a really good example of a couple different scenarios that oftentimes happen with kids who are doing their pretest with us for the first time. We're going to try this today. First thing I'm going to uh, ask you to do is just tell me uh, about how you are feeling when we do sight reading in class. Do you feel like you understand what's supposed to happen all the time? Sometimes I don't feel like I understand fully what's happening, but sometimes I hear my neighbors like doing the same thing as me, so I just think, you know what, maybe it's okay. And you feel like you're kind of sliding around to find what they're doing and like copying them sometimes? Yep, that's normal. Um, how about like if you make a mistake, do you feel like you know that you made the mistake? Um, not necessarily because I feel like sometimes I just, I think I get it right and mm -hmm. I just call it good. Okay, all right, good. Let's see how this goes for you. This is a level one. Can you find Do? Do, Do. Oh, yeah, it's in that kind of chest voice, part of your voice. Okay, good. Now can you sing your scale and arpeggio like we do in class? Do, re, mi. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do. Uh -huh. Do, ti, la, so, fa, so, la, ti, do. Do, mi, so, mi, do, fa, la, fa. Do, mi, so, mi, do, so, do. Sing that though. Do. Do. Now, now down the octave where the exercise starts. Do. 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 Mm, yep, good. So we're trying to really listen and, and tune. All right, so now you're going to take 20 seconds and just look through the exercise, try to figure out as much stuff as you can. Okay. Sing Do again. Do. Right. And sing. 
do do re. I'm going to pause you. You're doing great. Um, so your two do's need to sound the same. They Just, need to sound the same. They need to sound the same. So sing okay. the first do again. Do. Let's get back to see that's what happens when we change our, our note. Can you sing do? Do. do. Now sing the second do. Do. Yeah, so we need to make it match. So we'll start right on the okay, second. Oh, you want me to not make it match? <laughs> no. We want it to match. Oh. All right, here's this. Now let's okay. get, start on the second do and keep going. Okay. Ready and go. Do, re, mi, mi, fa. I did it accurate. No. Mi, 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 fa, mi, fa. Can you make your fa a little bit higher? Try again. Okay. Mi, fa. Keep going. Mi, re. Now can you remember the original do? Do. Yeah, that's good. All right, keep going. Measure five. Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do. Okay, good. Can you do a measure six to the end again? Yeah. With less accuracy. Make some mistakes. I need to help you more. Okay. <laughs> Let's see, okay. I'll give you an example just to make it really concrete. Because I just sing, like to try to make it more... Sing, mi, fa, so... But don't change pitch. <laughs> Kids do it okay. all the time, yeah. or not. All the time, mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> mi, fa, so, okay, fa... I'm going to pause you again. I'm going to pause you again. You're doing great. Do you see how these notes go higher? Mm -hmm. What did your voice do? It got lower. It got lower. So we're going to have to keep So you still want me to... Go up. Me, fa. Keep going higher. Just like you did in your scale. Okay. It was so good. Try again. Ready? Okay. And go. Me, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do. Uh-huh. Okay, good. So that's a level one exercise. I'm going to keep you at level one for your test in December because you can do all that stuff, but you needed a lot of my help. So your goal for December is to no longer need my help. Mm -hmm. So you practiced enough of those where you can start to work your way through that. And also remember on Sight Reading Factory, if you're not sure if it's right, you can click and check yourself. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. cool. So first, I want you to just tell me a little bit about how you feel like you're doing when we do this in class every day. Do you feel like you always understand what's supposed to happen, or are you confused a lot? Yeah, I feel like I'm doing really good. Okay. I'm understanding it, I'm getting it all good. Do you feel like, so when we put up the exercise on the screen and you're, you're able to tell, like if it's supposed to be do or me or so, yeah, you know what yeah, to start on? Um, and then how about once the exercise starts, once we start singing with the whole class and you make a mistake, do you feel like you know right away that that was a mistake? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, good. So that, I'm just going to try you on a level two then since you seem pretty confident. Um, and we're going to see how you do when you're by yourself because it's very different mm -hmm. when you're by yourself. So all the exercises start on do. And you can click this little guy right here to know what do sounds like. Can you sing do? Do. Good. Can you do your scale and arpeggio like we do in class? Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do. Very good. I'm going to pause you. So we've changed your do a little bit already. And I want you to just take, a, take your scale and make it go a little slower so that you can really hear that all the notes are accurate. Try again. Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi. Okay, we're in a major key, so we're going to do me instead of many. Do, re, mi. Can you try that? Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do. Keep going. Do, ti, la, so, fa, so, la, ti, do. Good, and we're going to have you do the scale down again. Um, make sure you find your chest voice or else that fa is not going to be quite accurate. Do, ti, la, so, fa. Try that. Do, ti, la, so, fa, so, la, ti, do. Keep going. Do, mi, so, mi, do, fa, la, fa, do, mi, so, mi, do, so, do. Okay, good. Yeah, so the getting the, the notes to be exactly in tune is very different when you're by yourself than when you're with other people. So now you're going to take 20 seconds and just take a look through this and try to figure out as much of it as you can, okay?
All right, let's give this a shot. One, two, and sing. Do, re, re, do. Okay, pause, pause, pause. You're doing great. That is do, and that's re, but that's not what do and re sound like. So what I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes and pretend like you're singing your scale again and just sing do, re. Do, re. Yeah. So it needs to sound like that even when you see it on the paper. Okay, let's try again. Ready? And go. Do, re, re. Do, re, mi. Okay, good. So do, mi needs to sound a little different than do, re. So why don't you take, close your eyes again and sing a scale that goes from do, re, mi. Do, re, mi. Good. Now open your eyes and sing do to me. Do, mi. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Mi, so. Ooh, okay, good. I'm going to have you try the same trick because we're going to learn tricks here, like learn tools. Close your eyes and sing Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So. Good. Now sing Mi, So. Mi, So. Uh huh. Yep. So that we want it to match those scales that we're singing before uh, before we read. Okay. So I want you to start right on So for three beats. Ready and go. So. chart on our wall, um, here it is, that we have hanging in the room. Mm -hmm. Okay, you are decoding and recognizing what things are called at sight like a boss. What is not as easy for you right now is, no, is this audio library, of knowing what each note sounds like. You're able to tell right away what they're all called, which is awesome, that's a good start, but we need to get your audio library more advanced before we move you on. So in December, I'm going to have this one be a level one, uh, not because you're dumb, but because I want to make sure that you're accurately moving up and down the scale before I give you something hard. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. You're done. Yay. <laughs> That's essentially what we do. Okay. Um, all right. I think I can go to the next slide, but let's keep Sight Reading Factory there. So let's just go to the next next slide. So that's the that's what I just did the last four days uh, before I came down here, um, hearing about 80 kids do that this week so far. All right, pretest, um, setting the floor for each student. That's what we're essentially trying to do. So we're, uh, based on their answers, I covered this already, but we're going to pick, uh, we're gonna pick their, um, oh yeah, no, stay on 24 though for now, because I didn't really talk about this part. So I'm picking the level based on their answers to the question. I, I covered that already. Then, uh, since you demonstrated, in fact, the, demonstrate, you, the demonstration you did was the it's just right for me. Okay, what that means is she struggled a bit, but she was able to work independently and solve most of the problems. So for me, what that means is that is the right level for that kid at that time. Okay? Because had she just flown through it, it's too easy. Fluent on the first try, then we're just going to bump up to a level two right away. Because I don't want her spending an entire semester wasting her life reading something she already knows how to read. Okay? Uh, then, if it's too hard, it, too hard would have looked like um, she's not able to get from one measure to the next, really, without my help. So, we, and we have those kids. We have those kids that, like, I can't really hear Do, Re unless you sing it for me. My audio library is not very advanced. I don't, I don't know how to make that, or, or oftentimes it's the muscle coordination part. Like, I just don't know how to get my boys, especially with the changing voice. Like, I don't know how to get it to happen. And so I'm helping them, like, along every single measure. Then I might add... Um, I might bump it down a level if, if I went too high, or I might add in interventions, like writing in the solfege syllables for them, to take your question from earlier today. Um, Sight Reading Factory can do that. I can s turn on a setting to where the, the solfege is written in for them, 
and or if typically with if with if it's boys, if it's changing voice boys, then one of the interventions I will do is I will set up a custom exercise for them that only that only happens in the pitch range that they're able to sing. Okay, so a lot of the changing voice that they're, they're they've just dropped an octave and they can sing A flat, B flat, and C. So then I will write on my little spreadsheet during the pretest that unless something has dramatically changed between now and December then we're just gonna put a test that uses three notes, but then they're still reading rhythms, they're still reading a key signature, it's gonna be in the key of A flat, and I'm gonna tell Sight Reading Factory to do only three notes. So that from the beginning of their first test, they're able to actually get a good grade because, and it, have it be right, and not, not like, well, just sing it in whatever key is comfortable for your voice, which happens a lot too. They're looking at the key of F, but then singing A flat and then being told that it's right. <laughs> you know? So I try to uh, make, that, make that happen if it's too hard. Okay, now let's try to go to 25. I have next. A yeah, go ahead. So let's say you have kids that are dyslexic. Uh-huh. And they see it go up, but they sing it down. Or they sing it up, but they're saying, so the first measure, they, say, they see it go up, but they say, or they sing do re, but they say do t, like so either either one, right? Mm -hmm. Would your intervention be to write in the solfege for them? What would your intervention be if they're at like a level one and you know they're dyslexic? So um, I'm glad you said that. So dyslexic kids have the same reading challenges that in music that they do in all other reading, uh, but it's not really. A, uh, like it's the, the idea that what dyslexia is is just swapping things is not really true. That's not really what dyslexia is. So dyslexia is um, uh, essentially the part of the brain, um, the part of the brain that does the uh, the connection of the sound to the the symbol they see to the sound in their head is underdeveloped. Essentially, it's the, 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 those two parts of the brain are not communicating as well. And so with dyslexic kids. They're actually being taught, if, if they get, go to a reading specialist, for example, that really helps them read well, what they're doing is actually the, uh, being taught to use different context clues to have a strategy-based guessing scheme, which is interesting. So earlier we were talking about how for typical kids, they're not supposed to try to guess. They're supposed to try to decode. But if you can't hear a sound in your head because of the symbol that you see, then decoding no longer works for you. And so then they have to like do something else, right? So in, for music though, what I've discovered is that my dyslexic kids don't need that type of intervention. They sometimes do need solfege written in, uh, but then oftentimes the biggest thing that helps them is just uh, reprinting the music so that it's bigger. Not because they have eye problems, which is also a common myth, <laughs> that it's a, that's an issue in the eye, but simply because uh, the, the lines and the spaces start to blur together in their brains sometimes. And by spreading it out, because like, that's another thing I love about Sight Reading Factory versus those books and the pre-printed stuff, is I can just take the little zoom scroll thing and zoom it and spread it out so that they can now see that there's this big old fat dot that has lines on the outside of it. That's a space. And they can see it so much easier. And so I think if, uh, if we, as educators, if we understand that the dyslexia is not a dis disability. It's a thing that is just harder for them. They're able to do it. They just need some visual help so that I'm, I'm not looking at this jumbled mess that's like really small and then trying to figure out all the, right? So it's an it's auditory and visual processing issue. And so by helping them process, I don't know if this is answering your question. Yeah. Um, individual assignments and tests. Now that we've done our pretest, so we've gone through that with every kid, we now know how to tell them to use their sight reading factory. And we tell them, no, you're not going to try to go to a level three when you were assigned a level one. If you feel like you've practiced so many of them that you really are at a level two or a three, come show me. But what I don't want you to do is be practicing a bunch of stuff that's outside of your vocabulary and doing it wrong. Because then, you know, it's not an ego test. Nobody else needs to know what your level is. <laughs> Which, um, so then, uh, myself, we get to decide uh, if they get to move up or a level, but basically we're looking for fluency. Once, once they're fluently doing the things that we're asking them to do at their level, then we move them up, and they don't get to decide if, they're, if it's time to move up, because like, then they're always just going to be at a level two. They're like, nobody, no kid wants to do the harder thing. So we, like, we assign that. Um, and we also uh, assess them at the end of each semester 
based on how this goes for them. Uh, the idea, though, is that it's a, a fluent, low-stress ex experience for them by the time they get to that point. Um, and then we move them up because I tell them that if they're not confused, they're not learning. And so they can't stay fluent at a level two forever because then they've stopped learning. They, they need to move up to the next level. Okay, so I kind of tie it all back together, and then I've got our last little exor uh, exercise. I'm going to pass out some sheet music, and we're going to be a little quieter here for a second, which will be fun. Um, the tools in the Kodai method are now more powerful when students know that the work is individual and progressive. And this is kind of tying it back to the very first thing I said when we all got here today, which is if our American education, music education system were such that our elementary school colleagues got the time that it actually takes to start kids with a Kodai method, for example, and sequentially build their skills towards a performance goal that happens for them later in their life, then a lot of these things, I think, would be moot points by now. But the reality is the stuff I'm talking about today has to, is essentially an intervention to get kids, at, when they get to high school, to learn stuff they probably should have and could have learned had they had a music ex experience daily, even every other day. I would, I, would be, I would love that. Every other day for a whole school year. Great. That would be something, because then you can actually build their brain while their muscles are growing, while their bodies are growing, you know, that kind of thing. But our kids don't get that. Um, so I think that the, these methods that like a Kodai workshop would typically talk about would be so much more powerful in that context, but that is not the context we live in. And now the tools must be applied in the rehearsals in the same way that they are applied by individuals. And that's what we're going to try to do next. So everything that I've been talking about for our individual literacy things, all the things about our brain, that is also how I rehearse my choirs. So we rehearse with all that stuff in mind. So when we pull out a piece of music... So what do you do once, once kids have like, hey, uh, I'm going to... They've come in and they've said, you're, up, you're good to go to the next, next level. Mm -hmm. um, and how often does that happen um, that, that you're finding they're, they're like, hey, can I come sing for you to go to the next level? Not very often. Really? Yeah, yeah, not very often. But typically, they, um, the, the time span that we assess them is once a semester anyway. And so it's rare that a kid needs time. They, they need time, especially at those lower levels of Sight Reading Factory, if they're new to it. They need time to get fluent anyway. So even if they were practicing every day, they're going to need, uh, for example, if I gave them level one because they struggled through it, kind of like you did, like just to get to the point where level one is now no stopping, just blast through it. That takes time anyway. So um, it, it does happen. It usually happens for kids who are like really obsessed with the idea of like they're worried that if they don't read a certain level, they're not going to make one of the upper level choirs. Yeah. That's that's, that's usually if, if a kid does that, that's why. Um, the, and my last question, I, I know that there is a read, there is a grading feature mm -hmm. on Site Reading Factory. Yeah. Yep. So you it's don't brand use new. The grade, you do use the grading feature, or I know that I, the kids can grade themselves and hear it. And yes, that. we've had kids start to play with it. Mm -hmm. um, we have not used it yet because we have we just now did our pretest. So I don't uh, typically I don't give assignments on Sight Reading Factory until we have done the pretest okay. uh, because I want it to be at the right level. And so now uh, this year, because that auto assessment for Sight Reading Factory is, is it, new, it's, new? it's a new okay. feature. So they 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 tested it over the summer basically, and now it's like it's working now. Um, but basically what we're going to do for this first year that it's out is we're going to take their, their level that I assign them for their tests. Now, keeping in mind that for our tests, we let kids stop and fix things. Yeah. But the auto assessment or all state audition doesn't. doesn't so, what we're, so that's a different skill. And so what we're doing now is we're going to try it. I don't, I'll, I'll probably do a podcast a year from now to tell people about how I think it went. But what we're going to do is we're going to take, you, let's say you, you test at a level four. That means you get to stop and fix things, or your do so wasn't high enough, so you had a chance to redo it and get enough air or whatever to get all the way up to that pitch. So you can do that at a level four, but auto assessment, you should probably do a level two, because okay. that means that you're not going to be able to, like, it's, it's, a, it's a different skill set. It doesn't mean you're suddenly stupid. You're just doing a different activity, which is don't stop, no matter what. Um, and so I'm hoping that what that ends up doing, that, that new game changer of a feature, I think, um, ends up being a way for our kids to get good at both things, which is like the the way I think of the stopping and fixing thing is like that's what a choir rehearsal is. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a real life practical skill that like picking picking this up and singing it perfectly the first time is great, but.
but that's not how a choir rehearsal goes. Like in almost no scenario, even at adults, they don't just pick up the song and sing it perfectly the first time. You, you need rehearsal skills, like literate, fluent, literate rehearsal skills. So that's essentially what we're testing them. And then the auto assessment feature is more like sight reading, like true, truly sight reading. Um, we but, play with it on Friday. So yeah, it's kind of fun. And I'm yep. thinking of our freshman girls class that you saw yesterday. Yeah. I know I have several girls in there that I feel as though in that sight reading setting, they're leaning on the girls around them. They're probably not reading. They're yep. just following along. Yep. So how do we as teachers then really make sure to invest in them so that they're growing while also keeping those kids that are have been playing piano forever and mm -hmm. band and whatever, still not getting bored. That's why I, that's why we do both, individual and group work. Because then because then we're able to also talk to them about how like it also matters that the choir reads well, because that's how we have a rehearsal. That's how we get our music learned. Um, but it also matters how you're doing, like individually. And so, that, but then of course the, the happy result of that is that when, once, once the individual kids start getting assessed and working on their own, then the choir of course gets better too. Like it's, it's um, by putting the choir's reading first, then sometimes the individual gets left behind. Um, but if we put the individual first, then the, the group just gets way better because then everybody, yeah, like everybody knows, the yeah, everybody knows what's going on instead of just the one band kid in every section or whatever. So do you, like, is there an assignment once a week, twice a week? What's, you know, how yep. often are you? Yeah, so now that we've done the pretest, they're going to get a, they're going to start doing the auto assess feature, uh, which is new, like I said, but they're going to do that quarterly. So they're going to get one assignment per quarter. And so their first one will come up here pretty soon, uh, right before our first concert, and then they'll get another one in December, and they'll get another one in like March, and then they'll get one at the end of the year. And those are designed to make sure that they are working towards their final so exam. So sum they're summatives, like they're, they're test grades, but they have access to practice as often. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. So they'll turn in, basically what we're gonna do with the auto assessment feature is we're gonna have them turn in a quarterly assignment at their assigned level for auto assessment, which is lower than their other level. And we're just going to tell them, um, turn in something where the machine tells you 90% or higher. Okay. Done. 90% or higher, it's a completion assignment. You're not getting 90% on the grade book, you're getting 100%. And they test there you, in your classroom? Say again? Do they test there in your classroom? Now the, yes. Now the actual final exam happens in a practice room. Um, and we have two teachers, so we divide up the whole class into two lines. And they come, it takes us three days with my concert choir with 96 kids but we, sometimes four days, uh, even with two teachers assessing, and they, but they watch a movie and, you know, hang out and, the, uh, and then come one at a time to, their, to do their test. Now the test itself takes up quite a bit less time than the, yeah. the, the pre-test does, because by that point they've already been through it a few times. Thank you as always for sticking around to the end of an episode. If you are still listening, that means you're one of the people who are MVPs of the Coralosophy podcast, the people who stick around to the end. Of course, the ways to help are to use the Coralosophy promo code at sightreadingfactory.com, mymusicfolders.com, threeminutetheory.com, endeavormusicpublishing.com, graphitepublishing.com, and of course you can join the Patreon. Link is in the show notes. You can also subscribe at Substack and chip in a few dollars a month there. All of those things are great ways to help, and of course like, share, leave comments, be part of the conversation. That's what this is all about. See you guys next time.